Thank you so much, you know, for being so kind and nice mm -hmm. and, you know, welcoming me to share my thoughts. Mm -hmm. Well, I'm a, by definition, you know, writer, journalist. Mm -hmm. I don't report much. I'm an opinion columnist mm -hmm. for different newspapers right now. In Turkey, I write for Hurriye Daily News, which is the English language paper mm -hmm. in Turkey, Star, which is Turkish language. Then I write for Al Monitor, which is a Washington-based website. Then I write for once a month International New York mm -hmm. Times. That's a new thing. So I've been writing about, I think, writing opinions uh, about Turkey, Islam in Turkey, Islam in the Middle East, Islam in the West, Turkish politics for a long time. Um, I don't come from an exact po journalism background. I studied political science. Then Ottoman history, then I wrote, a, it was about the Kurds in Turkey. I wrote a book about Kurdish, which made me a known figure in the intellectual circles. Then mm -hmm. I made my way into writing articles to newspapers. Uh, so it just unfolded that way. And uh, I'm a Muslim, of course, I'm proud to be, uh, alhamdulillah. And from my youth, I also have been engaged in Islamic circles, which are in an effort to re-understand Islam. Because on the one hand, when you read the Quran, you're inspired by all the noble messages in it. Uh, on the other hand, we see some disturbing realities in the Muslim world. Authoritarianism in the name of religion, sometimes violence in the name of religion. In short, closed-minded attitudes. And we have examples of that in Turkey as well. So I grew up in circles that my, my Islamic understanding uh, evolved in circles which were very loyal to Islam, but also were critical of some of the aspects of the uh, Muslim world and some of the authoritarian uh, cultures there. Mm -hmm. uh, so my, I, I, I don't have a, like a madrasa background. I didn't study Islam in a traditional fashion, but uh, in the past two decades, I've immensely studied the Quran, other Islamic sources, uh, jurisprudence and you know, Kalam and, and Tafsir and so on and so forth. And I've written about these things. And the more I've written, you know, I focus on certain areas. Uh, and I think uh, one of my realizations, like maybe 10 years ago, was that freedom is a very important issue in our part of the world. And the lack of freedom is a major problem. Mm -hmm. when, when you say, f and sometimes people, even people don't understand when you say freedom. For example, we all know that Islam has certain harams and halals and some fars, some some injunctions, right? We have to fast on Ramadan, we should pray, we should not do this, we should refrain from vices, sins, and so on and so forth. These are the commandments of Islam. But will the commandments of Islam be dictated by our own conscience, or will, will be dictated by a police, by a government? Uh, in other words, as a Muslim, should I fast because surrounding people around me the society forces me to fast, or people just respect my lifestyle, but I do fast because I want to worship God. Do I have that choice? And uh, I realize that having that choice is very critical to having a very genuine piety. In Turkey, we don't have Islamic law, but there has been cases like, for example, someone eats food in Ramadan and people harass him and say, why are you not fasting and so on and so forth. I realize that this is something very wrong because if you force that person to hide that he doesn't fast, you're not making him a Muslim, you're not making him a better practitioner, you're just forcing him to be hypocritical about his life. Maybe he doesn't fast because he's not a pious Muslim, maybe he doesn't fast because he has health issues, maybe he's not a Muslim at all. So uh, imposing religion, which is very common, I think is a problem. I believe religion should come from, of course we will share religion and we have the right to tebli, you know, mm -hmm. you know, make our messages heard. But once you start imposing this on people, you create a lot of troubles. Uh, and, and this is, I think, one of the key issues in the Muslim world, and it's not equally addressed. People, of, of course, always discuss Islam and democracy, but this very core part of democracy sometimes is not discussed enough. Mm -hmm. Therefore, I wanted to focus on this, and my book, Islam Without Extremes, is a product of the research and the contemplation about this key issue, freedom issue, uh, freedom to choose, freedom to believe, freedom to question uh, within the Islamic tradition. Okay, right. So, uh, as as you highlighted just now, that freedom is the central message which you are trying to promote through your work. 
uh, coming back to the issue of freedom, we notice that you also noted in your book like how freedom was very much uh, oppressed and suppressed by the uh, regime in Turkey before uh, before Turkey reaches its stage today, like under the rule of the military, for instance, or secular authoritarianism. Uh, I just can you actually highlight like how did the process underwent and affected the Muslims in Turkey that they are now can reach the stage where they are today with having perhaps more freedom as experienced right now in Turkey. Mm -hmm. <laughs> You're right. I mean, in Turkey, mm -hmm. the violations of individual mm -hmm. freedom mm -hmm. more often came from a secularist camp rather mm -hmm. than the Islamic camp. The Islamic camp in Turkey did not have political power until mm -hmm. very recently. Uh, the Turkish state was dominated by the group of people we call secularists, and they believe that religion, they're not they are not non-Muslim, they are Muslim, but they are generally non-practicing Muslims. And they want to minimize Islamic practice, make it less visible. They are like French secularists who have a problem with Catholicism, although they might be cultural Catholic. And that oppressive secularism in Turkey banned the hijab in universities. Mm -hmm. Thousands of Turkish students had to go to the West to find freedom, freedom to be a good Muslim, you know, in Western universities because they could not go to Turkish universities. Uh, they could not get fu public jobs. This is this has been changed recently. So now mm -hmm. Hajj scarf is free in Turkey. Um, in, now, who complained from this? Who opposed this? Mm -hmm. Of course, pious conservative Muslims who are observant and who wear the hijab or whose wives and daughters wear the hijab. They of course oppose this. But also in Turkey, the group that we call liberals also oppose this because liberals in Turkey said, in Turkey we have secularists, Islamists, and the liberals. You know, secularists and liberals are not the same thing. Mm -hmm. Secularists want to ban the hijab. Liberals said it's a woman's decision to wear what she wants. If she wants to wear the headscarf, that's her decision. The state cannot interfere with that. And that message made a lot of sense to the Islamic people as well. It's our decision. Why, do you, why does the state tell us? In that sense, freedom became a symbol, defend, like a slogan of the secularists and the Islamic camp against secular oppression. Uh, and finally, thanks to all the political battles and efforts by the secular, uh, against the secular oppression by the liberals and Islamists, the whole secular oppression system now has been mostly overthrown. Uh, the question is, now the Islamists, will they still respect religious freedom, mm -hmm. individual freedom, or will they now say, well, it will be good, like everybody becomes like us now. So that's the new concern. They shouldn't. And in practice, in theory, they say, okay, we're not. But there are some tendencies in the Islamic community to sometimes assert the new moral uh, values of the Islam. And liberals are saying the same thing. Okay, we defended you against the uh, secularists when they banned the head, headscarf. You should not interfere in people's lives. If they, people want to drink alcohol, they can drink alcohol. You should not, you shouldn't disapprove that. And I agree with that liberal position. Uh, and I don't think it's incompatible with Islam. It is compatible with Islam. And I think that liberal position gives us the medium in which we, come, we, become, we be, can become Muslims in the way we want. Mm -hmm. Because once you have an authoritarian understanding of Islam, it's always an authoritarian understanding of a, some brand of Islam. What if your Islam, your understanding of Islam doesn't fit mine? Why I would have to follow yours? Uh, that kind of freedom environment also gives you the diversity. And you are Shafi or Hanafi or Shia or these are all different understandings of Islam. Okay. Uh, so based on that freedom, we can all coexist. But if one group in society imposes its values on others, I think that is wrong and it creates a lot of social tension and uh, disrupts social peace. Okay. An interesting point here when you mention about the positions of the liberals as opposed to the secularists and also to the Islamists. Now, and you did mention, uh, at least as how I can understand from what you were mentioning, that the liberal camp basically have practicing Muslims as well, and also non-practicing Muslims, but uh, believing in these ideals of uh, liberty and liberal values. Mm -hmm. uh, just the uh, concerns like, how actually 
influential is this liberal camp. And uh, uh, a more interesting point of view that I would like to hopefully we can take notes like how did the uh, Muslim liberals uh, come up with their position? I mean, like, is it basically a study from the religious scriptures themselves? Or basically, uh, because we do hear voices from the Islamist camps, who usually try to uh, point out that these Muslim liberals are basically importing values from the West, which they are opposing, and has no uh, grounds within the Muslim and Islamic tradition. That's a very common mm -hmm. accusation. First mm -hmm. of all, I, against that, I argue that mm -hmm. individual freedom is not merely a Western value. Mm -hmm. It has ground in Islam. That's what my book is about. Because the, in Islam, the very idea that every individual will be judged by God in afterlife, by his own deeds, gives a very strong sense of individual. We, as individuals, we should be able to make choices, so God is testing us on this life. And I've explained how that thought you know, was articulated by Islamic scholars in the Middle Ages. So the idea of individual freedom is not alien to Islam. Secondly, those who say, why are you taking from the West some ideas, have taken ideas from elsewhere. I mean, what they think as Islam is actually a combination of Islam and medieval Middle Eastern political culture. I mean, the, because what we think as Islam has the Quran at the core, but a lot of layers on top of that. And those are cultural anyway. Uh, therefore, I mean, Islam should not imitate the West. It should not imitate the East either. Islam is a universal value. And if there are some good ideas from the West, we can take it. If there are some good ideas of the East, we can take it too. We as Muslims are not necessarily Eastern versus Western. Uh, we have our cultures, of course, but Islam is neither a part, a part of the West, neither opposed to the West. The West has some maybe discoveries which might be commendable from an Islamic point of view. The idea of democracy. Now, overwhelming majority of Muslims accept democracy today. The idea that you should have a ballot, you should put papers in it, and whomever gets the majority of the papers should be the prime minister of the country. That's now accepted by a majority. Of, well, this came from the West. Should we have rejected this? Well, if it's a good idea, why not? So I think they're making, to summarize, first of all, making the mistake of not seeing the idea of freedom within the Islamic tradition. Secondly, if the West has developed this idea more, so be it, it's a success, and we will condemn, we will keep on condemning Western imperialism and other Western injustices, but if they have created a good system of human rights, democracy, and that, that's an admirable thing. And if Japan has some good, inventions and I will take stuff from Japan and because because the whole actually humankind has is carries some fitra from creation although even if they don't have revelation different societies civilizations can have can reach certain wisdoms because they carry the mind the intellect the consciousness that is given to every human being by God okay yeah Okay, when coming back to one of the key points which you raise in your book, when you talk about freedom, it's like uh, we should avoid judging people, things which can only be judged by God. Uh, and you highlighted, you highlighted a very, uh, what I would say, forgettable, uh, not really forgettable, it's like a forgotten group of Muslim philosophers called the Murjiites and you did bring out their ideas to, to light in your book and in many ways when I read it ba based on what I learned back in school and what were the Murjiites the Murjiah is like uh, they were portrayed as a, a group which are against the Ahlul Sunnah as a matter of fact because they wanted to postpone judgments and are free to do whatever they want to do in this present life. That's how the Murjiites were being portrayed. Now, coming back to your work, you actually uh, shed a different light on the issues of the Murjiites. Now, how do you see the message of the Murjiites is really central for us to understand the concept of freedom 
in Islam? First of all, the Murgiites emerged mm -hmm. before, before the formation of Ahl Sunnah as mm -hmm. a jurisprudence school. So mm -hmm. it is hard to say they were against Ahl Sunnah. They, they were before Ahl Sunnah. Ahl mm -hmm. Sunnah was if formed by Imam Shafi uh, or Hanbali or, uh, or Maliki, partly Hanafi. You know, Murgiites existed before that. So mm -hmm. it's, a, it's, a, it's an earlier controversy. Plus, Abu Hanifa, the founder of the Hanafi school, was inspired by Murjai thought. Mm -hmm. It's not alien to Ahl Sunnah thinking. Uh, Sorry. You're welcome. Third, Ahl Sunnah is a ma mainly a matter of jurisprudence, fiqh, uh, whereas Murjaites is a kalam school, so different mm -hmm. branches. Third, and fourth, well, honestly, every Islamic community in the past, every Islamic school of thought, most of them said, we are the right method and all others are hereticals. Mm -hmm. I think we should get over with that thought a little bit. We should be able to learn wisdom from different Islamic schools of thought. We can still continue to subscribe to a certain school, but if there's a Shiite philosopher with some good views on politics, I will learn from that. The fact that I'm a Sunni doesn't stop me from learning from that person. Let alone if we can learn from Christians as well. But especially within the Islamic uh, frame of reference, different schools of thought are richness of Islam and instead of seeing these are the heretics, these are the uh, we can agree or disagree but we should be able to learn and I think Murjiites by saying that we cannot say people have become infidels we cannot do any takfir we should leave this decision to Allah ha they have created a basis for tolerance and pluralism it doesn't mean that you can't have an opinion about other people but it means that you cannot claim to punish them, shortcutting the punishment that God will give them in afterlife, or the blessing God will give them in afterlife. Uh, therefore, I think remembering the Murjaid approach to the events is very important today, and because in the Muslim world today, look at what's happening in Syria, look at what, look at what is happening in Iraq. Muslims are bombing each other's mosques. I mean, can you believe people go to mosque to pray, another Muslim shouting Allahu Akbar comes and bombs the mosque. This is a shame. This is a horrible thing. Well, Christians did the same thing for centuries after, until they came to the idea of tolerance and pluralism. Mm -hmm. Unfortunately, we are in a kind of a dark era in that sense. To overcome this, we need ideas which will make Muslims a bit more tolerant, respectful to diversity, and they can criticize each other. They can say, I find this idea very wrong, but it doesn't mean that you can attack that person and you can punish them in the name of Allah. Punishment is uh, in, in the world, my, my argument is that we can punish crimes, of course, if somebody go kill somebody, that's a crime. But we cannot punish people for their ideas, for their beliefs, which can change. And ultimately, it's Allah who will judge them in afterlife. Uh, maybe that person will go like this for 20 years, and maybe 20, 50 years, he will change his mind and maybe come to our side. Maybe we'll go to the other side, who knows, during our lifetime. Life is a test, and it is Allah who will ultimately judge the results of that test. We should allow people to have that freedom. Okay, okay. Uh, now uh, let's go back to more recent times, okay. Like the development of Islamism in Turkey, uh, we see, at least from my reading, uh, we see how scholars like Said Nursi, Fatullah Gulen, also scholars even like, and politicians like Erbakan with his Miligorus, uh, and how it transformed later on, uh, it helped to shape the discourse of the Muslim society in Turkey uh, for them to be more receptive on the ideas of freedom and such. Uh, and also at present, I also see similar discourses took place in other parts of the Muslim world during the era. Like in Indonesia, we had scholars like Nur Khalis Majid, Jalaluddin Rahmat, uh, Abdul Rahman Wahid in Tunisia, well-known figure Rashid Ghanoushi, Malik bin Nabi. Uh, but I would like to point out that in Malaysia, we hardly have that much scholars who are adding to the discourse on ideas such as liberty and freedom, uh, which in many ways helped to flourish the reception of the society on democratic values. Now, how do you see is it uh, how crucial do you see the importance to have indigenous discourse for for democratic values it is to, 
to to be realized within that particular subject. It is very important to mm -hmm. have indigenous discourse. Also, mm -hmm. though, there is no harm in learning from scholars mm -hmm. from different countries. Mm -hmm. I think Rashid Ganoushi's ideas have been helpful to mm -hmm. Muslims across the world in terms of democracy and Islam. Turkish thinkers have been influenced by people like Rashid Ganoushi or Fazlur Rahman or this mm -hmm. and that. So, it is inevitable that the Ummah will have some interconnectedness and learn mm -hmm. from this. But it's also important to have some local figures. Now, among the names you mentioned in Turkey, Arbakan and Erdogan are political leaders. Mm -hmm. Fethullah Gülen and Said Nursi are religious scholars. These are, of course, different levels. Mm -hmm. uh, and I think all of their experience means something and has taught and has added something to uh, Turkey. But one, there's one difference. For example, Said Nursi was an Islamic scholar who, who for Islam, wanted to write books, defend the Islamic faith, refute atheism and other godless ideologies of the modern age. He wants to be, he wants to just do tebli with what he writes, like proclamation of Islam. That's very civil, no politics involved. And Nursi stayed away from politics. That is, some people call that the cultural Islam. Intellectual, moral teaching. Then there is political, Arbakan and Erdogan type. And Arbo, Arba, Arbakan, of course, was the arch Islamists. Erdogan moderated Arbakan's positions in many ways. So open up a new chapter and less, less hostile to the West, a bit more pragmatic with regards to the economy and other things. And he's created a success story in Turkey. But let's not forget that that is only about government. Uh, it doesn't necessarily make people more faithful. It's about how to run the country. And that's why some people call it political Islam. And, and I find the term political Islam sometimes a little problematic because Islam doesn't give you a sense of government, the, the blueprint for government. When you read the Quran, it doesn't tell you whether you should be a monarchy, a republic, whether you should have elections, uh, how many branches of the government. I mean, these, the Quran is not interested in that. The Quran is interested in giving you hidayah, the guidance as an individual human being. I think that's a core issue. But then, of course, there's a legal aspect of Islam, there's a political aspect of Islam, but sometimes political Islamists disregard the culture, the faith, the morality, and just obsess on politics, and having an Islamic system of government, which is mostly a construct. Because when you say Islamic system of government, you're actually taking some ideas from the Quran and the, and the tradition, but you're, you're combining them with some modern ideas that you, you accept. So it is an ideology more than religion in that sense. Uh, whereas Islam is not an ideology. It's not about how to have an efficient political system. It's about how to understand God, the purposes of creation, morality, afterlife. These are the main issues of uh, Islam. Therefore, I believe that we should focus on cultural issues a bit more than the political issues. In political issues, I mean, uh, the, we can benefit from the world's experience. I mean, humanity has tried different systems of government, democracy works, liberal values. We can learn from other different civilizations. Uh, therefore, I, I am a bit critical of turning Islam into an ideology, which sometimes has led Muslims to focus too much on politics, be driven too much by politics, but make less emphasis on the more fundamental issues about our faith. Uh, okay, thank you again, Mr. Akyol. My pleasure. For your willingness to uh, be interviewed by us. We hope that all of our guests today would have benefited from the uh, interview sessions now. And I thank you all. Yeah, for I'm so honored and glad to meet the Islamic Renaissance Front for people who think you, know, you initiated this uh, wonderful effort in Malaysia. Uh, ideas spread through vanguard people. And of course, we shouldn't be arrogant in saying that we have the right, right way. But it's important to have alternative discourses in Muslim societies. Therefore, I believe institutions like the Malaysian uh, Islamic Renaissance Front will serve their nation and in the Ummah beyond. And we will see the fruits in the upcoming years and decades, inshallah. Thank you again. You're welcome.